We figured since we have you in here, we'll hold you hostage for parts one and two, if that's okay. So appreciate uh, you guys coming here today and, and spending a little bit of time. So what I'll, I'll start, uh, Sean Gardner, Senior Marketing Manager for uh, Xilinx and uh, responsible for cloud video. I'm gonna sort of set the stage for what Maurice will then go into a bit of a deeper dive on what it is and how we're enabling FPGAs in the cloud and some of the infrastructure that we're building that is really enabling many of our partners to create what we believe is, is really a bunch of interesting applications and really enabling uh, video acceleration. And naturally, the first question is, why do you need video accelerations? I think if you look at uh, the growth in live applications, that's over the course of the last several years, if you think about broadband connectivity, wired and wireless, and I think this is gonna become more the case, not less, with uh, 5G deployment, we're talking to a number of wired uh, communications company, and certainly things like gigabit per second to the home uh, is gonna be you know, realizable very shortly. And so this is gonna enable more live interactivity, more use cases. And what we're showing here is, is really just a, a, a representation of just some of the live or latency critical applications. Certainly when you start moving things like live gaming to the cloud, uh, you really do need real-time processing. And so this is where FPGAs specifically can can really help and if you're noticing or tracking at all what Xilinx has been doing, what you're seeing now is that we're offering PCIe cards in servers through partners like Advantech, which we're showing here. Um, we're also are now offering FPGAs in the cloud, public cloud providers like AWS, uh, Alibaba, Huawei, these are large uh, cl public cloud providers where now that FPGAs are there, now you can make use of them, then the question is how do we make use of them? And we'll get into some of that. So one of the things we wanna highlight is a recent announcement that we made with uh, our partner NG Codec and their implementation of VP9 and uh, the utilization that Twitch is going to be rolling out using our FPGAs with NG Codex VP9 encoder and just the uh, acceleration that's realizable with our, uh, with our solution. So we talk about live streaming and live production. It's, it's and I said it's a growing market. This just kind of, this is a markets and market report that just shows that over a five year period, we're talking about a, a 2X growth and a significant uh, opportunity from a, a revenue or market size perspective. This does not include some of the uh, additional things like eSports or interactivity. When you look at some of these applications, you can see how uh, social media and something like Facebook Live in conjunction with live streaming, and then you layer on top of it maybe an interactivity uh, aspect how things can really start to change, and, and these are not actually included in this market uh, sizing report. So it's, it's really more video, but more pixels. This becomes the other interesting element. As broadband connectivity widens, the ability to stream higher resolutions, and if we think back, you know, I don't know, five years ago, it was kind of SD was or even sub SD resolutions. 320 was a common, very common streamed app, uh, resolution. But now you're seeing the same resolution on your cell phone that we have in many cases hanging on our wall. And 4K is, we've been talking about 4K for a long time, but 4K is kind of the de facto uh, resolution for most TV sales. And we're seeing uh, pixel pitch and resolutions now for tablets where we're gonna to start to see ultra HD and smaller form factors. And I think that that's also gonna drive the market. But what this creates is we've got this more video, more pixels, and when we think about how CPUs have done a great job kind of servicing the market to date, but when we look at how most of the video was streamed, it was kind of file-based, video on demand, OTT, where time isn't critical. But with live video, we've got this growth of, of pixels. Now CPUs are, are start, 
uh, are starting to be challenged. But in conjunction with that, we've also got uh, codec complexity as we opened up and wanted to enable more use cases and higher resolutions and, and more interactivity, the challenge with that has been bandwidth. And so we've migrated to new codecs. Each new codec brings a theoretical 50% uh, bandwidth savings, but with it a 5x, generally a kind of 5x plus compute complexity. And so we have this layering, so more pixels, uh, more video, and now we've got this huge problem from a more compute standpoint. And when we think about how CPUs uh, are challenged by this, we understand that something else is needed. And you know, there's quite a bit of activity and discussion going on here and in the market about AV1. And AV1, we believe, will definitely be a uh, critical codec looking forward, but we can see that with it comes a, a big penalty. So how do we enable live applications with AV1? So we need acceleration of some sort. In addition to that, the challenge is also, if we think about, uh, or maybe even people in the audience, are in a situation where if you look at your cell phone or you look at your, your uh, internet access bill, it's been relatively flat. Yes, it goes up maybe several percentages by year, but if you look at the, the data usage, which turns into a network or CapEx ex expense, it's going up massively. So this creates this, this no man's land, this gap of average revenue per user and your costs of maintaining a network to support all of this data. I talked about how CPUs are challenged to handle um, many of these live workloads. And in some respects, this is kind of taking something like X265, which is, is what we did is we took uh, X265 and we ran it on several high-end instances on F1. And what you see here is, uh, obviously you can almost think of this visually as file size, but also when you get to the very slow preset, yes, you get great compression efficiency, but you pay that penalty of throughput. And so everybody would like this kind of, of compression efficiency, but really at this kind of speed. And when we talk about live video at, at least 60 frames per second, we're way over here. So how do we do that? What, what are the options? So from a, uh, a Xilinx perspective, we've, we've kind of looked at Moore's Law, and you're hearing a lot about this, which is you know, over the course of the last you know, 11 or 12 years, Intel has done a great job at increasing compute capability you know, as you can see, 41x. But as I talked about, we've got live video at a 2x growth, resolution at kind of 96, and the growth of comp compute complexity from a codec standpoint gives you a total, a, a total uh, aggregate compute requirement. And so you can see this 41x versus 223x, we've got a big discrepancy. So. When we map out workloads from a Xilinx perspective, we kind of see them breaking down into an OPEX heavy and a CAPEX heavy. And we see generally CPUs and software really continuing to address uh, the OPEX side. But on the CAPEX side, this is generally this long tail of video where you've got lots of streams, but maybe not generating lots of traffic. So if you think about it, it's the 80-20 rule, that if uh, you've got a big percentage of your traffic being generated by 20% of your streams, you've got 80% of your streams only generating 20% of your bandwidth requirements. If you think about YouTube or uh, one of the social media, maybe Kardashians streams a video out, huge influx of people watching that video. But if it's me and I'm posting something, probably maybe one or two people watching it, which isn't generating a lot of traffic, but there's a lot of me's out there, and this becomes an issue. 
So how do you control? So from a Xilinx perspective, we see, the, we see the market really breaking out into one of these two. You could think of video conferencing as kind of being a CapEx issue. Lots of people having one-on-one -on -one conversations. That becomes a, a, a workload that you try and address from a, a cost per channel. When you have very popular streams, that becomes a bandwidth challenge. So you need to address both of these workloads a little bit differently. And from a Xilinx perspective, we have solutions um, that address both of those. I'm going to talk a little bit about this next. And Maurice will get into the CapEx side, or, or rather the OpEx side, a little bit more in his presentation. So from a, a Xilinx perspective, we have what is referred to as our Zinc uh, MPSOC. Um, in this device, we've got a, a quad A53 uh, ARM cores. This also has a hardened video engine. This really addresses the ability to get the lowest cost per channel. So this can support 4K, P60, 264, HEVC, real time. And it is really focusing on trying to get the uh, highest density, lowest cost and power envelope as possible. We actually uh, recently, oops, we actually recently uh, and are showing here at our booth uh, through one of our partners, Opera, who's got a chassis where we can support 384 transcode channels in a uh, 750 watt envelope. And if you're replacing uh, general software, this gives you a, a very high density uh, replacement and reduces obviously your square footage and your, uh, and your uh, power. When we look at it from a cost and power perspective, when we compare it to something like Intel's uh, VCA or VCA2 or NVIDIA's Pascal, the P4, you know, you can see that from a size perspective, this is about just a little bit uh, larger than an American size business card. It is, so it's very small, hence the reason why we can fit so many of those into such a small uh, area. The power you can see is very small at 20 watts for the full, for the full card versus 75 or 235 with uh, Intel's VCA. And also, because this is a uh, fully integrated device, we can achieve very uh, effective cost per, cost per channel. And also, when you look at the power per channel, you can see at 5 watts versus 15 or, or 78 from a, an Intel perspective. When we look at um, some of the things that you can do, because we are marrying FPGA fabric, which is programmable. Uh, we have ARM cores, which enables software. And then when we have IP, like our partner Screens, who we also have at our booth, and I invite you all to come by, we can enable many new use cases and can bring things like machine learning uh, with video. And in this scenario, what we're showing is, you know, in one case, it's personalized cloud media, where maybe you have uh, several video streams where you've got coming in. You want to enable that with uh, social media, or you want to incorporate a real-time betting or other interesting use cases. So we can show how the marriage or this mixing of various types of content uh, and do this all in a live scenario. In another case where you might want to, uh, maybe a more traditional smart city, where you're taking machine learning and marrying that with video encoding and transcoding to optimize for storage, but you can also blend that with, uh, with web page or HTML5 and graphics. And we've also, and, and, and very kind of interesting, is enabling the ability to create touch um, in the cloud. So all of the processing happens in the cloud, but you create the ability to, for inputs and can dynamically allow any display to be essentially be a smart, uh, smart display. And then obviously there's other interesting things like telemedicine or, or other use cases that we're enabling. And this is all with the same infrastructure and software. 
So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Maurice, but I don't know if, if there's any questions, we can answer them now or we can uh, wait to the end. So if anyone has a question, you can raise your hand. Otherwise, I'll hand it over to uh, Maurice. Go ahead. Sure. Hey guys, just repeat the question so we get it on, on the audio. Sure. So we're, uh, for when we're talking about uh, doing a comparison between, say, ourselves and Intel or NVIDIA, we're really comparing anchoring to a common uh, video quality. And so on the right-hand side, which is what I was covering, which is really the op, uh, the uh, sorry, the capex side. We're looking at something like if uh, we had to map that to say like X two six five or X two six four, it would probably be something like fast or faster uh, preset. For the left hand side, which is what Maurice will talk about, the opex side, that's where we're focused at really getting the best quality at the lowest bit rate. So again, if we had to kind of reference something like X264, X265, it would probably be somewhere close to slow or somewhere between slow and medium and in, with some content maybe very slow as well. Yep. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you, Sean. So. Um, I'll uh, uh, show this slide again. So as, as Sean mentioned, I'll focus on the Vertex uh, ultrascale family of our uh, devices, which is fabric only. So there's uh, no car ARM cores involved uh, in, in that device. And uh, typically encoders, decoders, uh, other video filters can be uh, enabled in, as a, a soft IP fashion uh, in, in those kind of uh, devices. Um, before we start looking at uh, what to accelerate, um, in this slide I'm, I'm showing a, uh, a, a live video uh, or, or a, a live transcode flow that, that shows uh, all the functional blocks in a, in a audio video uh, transcode from security, description, uh, container handling, demuxing, then splitting it into an audio path and a video path and then uh, merging it back again, applying the security and the, uh, the, the container uh, again. So in terms of, of workload, um, I have the, the relative workload there. Video uh, decode uh, is, is roughly about 10% of, a, of, a, of the workload. Uh, video processing, like scaling, pre-filtering, post-filtering, 30%. Uh, and the encode is the heavy lifting. That's 60% of the workload. So what we're proposing is that we uh, accelerate the video portion of a a transcode application and we leave the audio uh, processing and the audio path we leave that alone that will uh, sit on a on a x86 also all the decryption the the um, container handling and, and those kind of things uh, we we do not address we will keep that running on an, on an x86 so then uh, this slide shows uh, the encoding configurations uh, that we're after in our, our soft uh, IP solution. And, and uh, as Sean already pointed out, is, uh, we're here comparing ourselves at um, the FFmpeg slow setting of uh, X265 uh, on a uh, dual socket um, Intel Xeon E5. You would be able to run that uh, at about 10 frames per second. Um, we have a, a single socket card with a, a VO9P, and by uh, the end of this year, uh, our partner NG Codec will have a solution that can run at 120 frames uh, per second. Um, looking at the uh, device power uh, that we take uh, for, compared to what, for example, an Intel takes, so Intel, uh, the device power is 240 watts. This single socket uh, VO9P takes less than 40 watts, that gives you a, a 70x uh, performance per watt uh, improvement by accelerating this function on your uh, FPGA. And then uh, there's also uh, dual socket VU9P cards uh, available from our uh, partner Advantech, which means per card uh, you'll be able to run 
uh, 1080p, 240 frames per second or, or four uh, live uh, streams at 60 frames per second. So uh, the, the next couple of slides talk about how we integrate into, uh, into FFmpeg. Um, FFmpeg is the, uh, the leading multimedia framework uh, that enables uh, decode, encode, uh, muxing, uh, demuxing, and is, is used in a lot of uh, live uh, streaming use cases in the data center. Uh, if you know how to use FFmpeg, then uh, you can pretty much benefit from Xilinx uh, acceler accelerated video streaming. There's no FPGA uh, ex uh, experience required. So uh, this, this slide uh, shows the, the entire architecture stack. Um, I start at the, uh, at the bottom. So in terms of, uh, of hardware, uh, we have an x86 server that has one or more uh, uh, PCI uh, Express plug-in cards, the, the Xilinx uh, Alveo uh, accelerator cards. Those accelerator cards take uh, Xilinx uh, accelerator binaries. Those are uh, pre-built uh, binaries that you can uh, program the, the card with. And an accelerator binary can be, for example, machine learning kernel. This could be a uh, VP9 uh, transcoding binary. This can be an HEVC transcoding binary. So. This, this card takes any kinds of um, acceleration. Then um, uh, on top of that, uh, that card, we have um, a Xilinx runtime API that runs uh, on, the, uh, on the x86 that takes basically care of all the, uh, the card management uh, function. Uh, then we have an abstraction for uh, media acceleration uh, called the, the Xilinx uh, Media Acceleration or XMA. And then uh, on top of that, uh, we have the, the FFmpeg uh, framework, and we're working with uh, yeah, partners to uh, provide FFmpeg plugins for all the various accelerators that uh, we are enabling on our platform. And then on top of the, the FFmpeg framework, you can have customer applications that take care of, for example, the, the orchestration of the, the transcodes in a uh, complete data center. So we're building uh, an ecosystem with our partners to provide uh, FFmpeg plugins for our uh, accelerators. And uh, this is a, uh, not, not a complete uh, uh, list of all the uh, ecosystem partners, but uh, the things I want to highlight. So in terms of uh, H.264, uh, we're working with a partner called Alma that has a high density encoder and they can uh, host 12 1080p60 channels on uh, one of these cards. Uh, our partner IDT has a high quality encoder. Uh, they can go up to three uh, channels per card. Then our partner VYU Sync uh, has a uh, high density decoder. Uh, I already mentioned uh, NG Codec, so they have uh, both a high quality uh, HEVC encoder as well as a uh, high quality VP9 uh, encoder. Uh, currently, uh, they fit one 1080p60 channel in our device, but they are uh, on track to fit uh, two uh, of these instances in, in one device. And that is, that is really also the beauty of uh, an FPGA. It is, it is programmable. You can keep working on your architecture. You can keep working on increasing clock uh, frequencies, making your implementation smarter and therefore getting the, the most out of your, uh, your FPGA. So they'll be able to make a 2x uh, improvement by, uh, by the end of the year. Then um, Path Partner has uh, HEVC uh, decoders. Um, uh, NG Codec uh, also will have AV1 on the roadmap as an item for uh, 2019. Uh, our partner Vnova uh, has uh, their codec uh, Perseus Plus uh, running on our platform, which basically uh, is a 4x density or bitrate uh, improvement function. And then uh, Xilinx provides uh, some infrastructure IP like a WebP encoder, ABR scalers, and, and things like that. And uh, the, uh, the, the rows listed in, in yellow are actually things that uh, you can look at in our, in our booth. So please go take a look at our, our booth and, and take a look at uh, some of these uh, products yourself. So um, like I mentioned, we, uh, one thing that, that we do is we provide uh, seamless integration into the, uh, the FFmpeg uh, framework. And that, that looks uh, 
uh, looks kind of like, like this. In, in the top uh, box, you see uh, an FFmpeg command line that uh, uses a, a, a libx264 encoder. Uh, by just changing which encoder you want to use, uh, you can now target an FPGA rather than target an encoder running on your uh, x86 uh, system. And all the, uh, the FFmpeg um, command line options for setting bit rates and, and things like that will be uh, understood by uh, the accelerator uh, plugins and, and will uh, talk to the underlying hardware instead. So going down in this uh, FFmpeg stack, uh, the next thing we find is the, uh, the Xilinx Media uh, Accelerator uh, API or, or uh, framework. Um, that consists of a, a couple pieces of uh, functionality. One is it has a, um, a host interface that has a, a very simple API, uh, like send data to uh, the acceler accelerator, receive data from the accelerator, uh, send and receive frames, then uh, it, it also has a, a plugin interface, and, and we provide uh, plugin APIs for uh, decoders, encoders, uh, scalers, filters, uh, things like that. And I'll talk a little bit more about the API on the, on the, the next slide. Um, it has a resource manager that it ensures that uh, an accelerator resource uh, can be uh, reserved for the lifetime of a, uh, of a video uh, session. Um, and then it also takes care of uh, reusing uh, a, a plugin for, uh, uh, by, by multiple processes running on, on uh, one uh, host x86. Um, taking a look at the, um, the XMA plugin uh, interface, it, it's also um, uh, fairly simple. So plugins have APIs to uh, allocate uh, buffers and, and free buffers. Uh, they have uh, an API to write uh, buffers uh, to the device that is over PCI Express, to read buffers uh, from the device, again, over PCI Express. And then they have a, a register read and write and, and dump interface. Uh, so basically, programming uh, an accelerator uh, is, is uh, kind of like writing a, a driver in a, in a user space fashion using uh, these APIs. So then finally, at the, at the very bottom of our uh, architecture st uh, st uh, stack, there is the uh, Xilinx uh, LVO accelerator card. Uh, these cards are uh, adaptable uh, for multiple workloads in a, in a data center. Uh, in, in, in this case, I'm talking about video transcoding, but we can run machine learning uh, workloads on these cards. We can do accelerated database searches on these cards, uh, run genomics. And uh, the other uh, um, interesting piece is that these cards actually can be uh, dynamically reconfigured in, in uh, a matter of seconds. So for example, if you have uh, your card configured to, be, uh, to do a uh, HEVC transcode, for example, within a matter of seconds, you can reprogram your card to do a VP9 uh, transcode. So next I'm gonna look at um, couple different uh, use cases. Uh, first, this is uh, a use case where I show a uh, ABR, an adaptive bitrate uh, video transcode uh, flow on our device. In this case, uh, I'm showing uh, that we have three accelerators uh, downloaded on our device. We have a uh, H.264 decoder. Then we have uh, an ABR scaler that takes, takes in one uh, resolution and generates a ladder of uh, smaller resolutions. And then we have, um, in, 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 in this case, uh, yeah, potentially two uh, HEVC or VP9 uh, encoders. Um, this is uh, basically, the, the bottom part is the accelerator binary that gets downloaded on the card. And then uh, the top part shows the FFmpeg uh, application running on a, uh, on a x86. Uh, one thing that I uh, also want to mention is uh, this, this ABR scaler uh, that is uh, uh, accelerated on the device actually also has an output path um, that can generate an RGB uh, rendition for a machine learning uh, kernel, which is this, this path on top, of, uh, on top of here, where we uh, potentially subsample uh, the, the incoming stream at a lower frame rate and send that out to a, a machine learning uh, inference uh, engine. I'll 
talk about that uh, more in the, in the next slides. So uh, this is another uh, use case that I'm going to talk a little bit more in, in the next slide. So this shows uh, integrated uh, machine learning in a, uh, in a decode flow. So in, in this case, we have programmed our uh, accelerator card to have an ASA264 decoder or multiple. And then uh, the, the Xilinx XD and then uh, machine learning kernel and then uh, potentially an H.264, HEVC, or VP9 encoder. And in that case, uh, on uh, the host, you would run your F of MPEG flow that would do the decodes, uh, but also do uh, machine learning integrated in your, uh, in, in, in your uh, video transcode, uh, transcode flow. So, um, yeah, a little bit more about this, this uh, video plus uh, machine learning uh, solution. So uh, one thing that, we're, uh, that we have done is we've, we've built a, a so-called uh, video uh, ML uh, server, so a video machine learning uh, server that can be, um, uh, that works in, in conjunction with uh, either video transcoding uh, use cases or uh, can also work with, for example, the safe city uh, use cases that are heavy on uh, on decodes, but uh, do not need uh, to re-encode, so they, they don't need uh, encoders in, in that case. This um, video machine learning uh, server uh, consists of uh, uh, three, uh, three functional blocks. It, it has an ingest layer that uses the uh, GStreamer framework, uh, supports the RTP protocol, and can handle um, many different input streams uh, uh, over this uh, over this network, and and this is tens of of uh, streams that we're talking about, and it all depends on the number of um, and the 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 networks, uh, the machine learning networks that you are trying to to run on the machine learning server. Then uh, the analytics uh, layer queues up all the requests from all the different uh, streams, and will run. Uh, all the, the networks on the machine learning uh, kernel. You can cascade uh, networks. Networks can be reprogrammed uh, on the fly. And then we also have database uh, functionality that uh, stores the, uh, the, the analyzed uh, video in a, a generic database uh, structure with timestamps that later on you can, uh, you can query uh, uh, yeah, from, uh, from another system. And this all is, is running on, on one, uh, this can run on one uh, accelerator card, but we support actually uh, different uh, topologies. So this shows three uh, different, uh, different topologies. We can uh, have a close integration between a machine learning kernel and a uh, transcode uh, accelerator, for example, where both the, uh, the, the decode, the scaling, the encode as well as the, the analytics would uh, run on a, on a single card. Um, another option is to have a uh, one card dedicated for uh, machine learning and then uh, a number of other cards in your server uh, dedicated to transcode. So in this case, let's say you have a server with, uh, that can host eight cards, seven of these cards uh, could be running transcodes uh, and then you send uh, frames at, at a lower frame rate to this machine learning uh, server that will then do uh, the, uh, the video analytics. And uh, the third uh, topology I'm showing is where you could have multiple racks of uh, video transcodes and potentially only one rack of uh, ML functionality. So this is fully scalable depending on uh, the use case uh, that you want to run uh, on your machine learning server. Just one point to that. that I, I think that if you look at uh, video applications where maybe in the top scenario, the uh, machine learning could be a feedback loop back into your encoder, and that would be an application where you would want the machine learning and the video to sit on the same card or in the same FPGA. In, in the second scenario, we're seeing applications where um, I, I call it you know, big video and little ML where maybe your machine learning doesn't need to operate on every frame. It's maybe a subset. So your machine learning might only be operating at say three or five frames per second, but you have multiple channels. So in that scenario, 
you, you don't need a lot of machine learning with uh, an FPGA, so you would actually could feed many video channels into a single machine learning uh, capable card. And as, as Maurice said in the bottom, that you, you can then can scale this at, at a rack level or at, at when you start looking at deploying this at scale, you might actually want to keep these as separate full entities because maybe you'd have multiple racks and, and some may feed into machine learning and some may not. Yeah, the, the beauty of this all is that the, the actual software uh, stack will be the same whether you're using uh, a single card uh, or a, a multiple server uh, architecture. So in terms of uh, machine learning, uh, this just shows a, a sampling of models that we have uh, available today from, from DeFi that ranges from uh, face detection to person uh, people detection, pose estimation, and then uh, video uh, analytics like object detection, uh, car uh, logo detection or attributes uh, detection, license plate recognition and, and so forth. And then uh, finally, my, uh, my last slide. So if you want to uh, learn more about um, Xilinx uh, video transcoding, uh, we have an ABR uh, transcode evaluation package uh, available uh, that, that anyone can, uh, can download. That includes uh, evaluation versions of our uh, partner NG codec, HEVC, and uh, VP9 uh, encoders. Uh, absolutely no FPGA experience is required to uh, get this up and running. These are just software packages that you install like any other uh, Linux software package with a yum install or an AppCat uh, install. Uh, it will run on the uh, Xilinx uh, LVO accelerator card. And uh, if you have a hard time getting your hands on uh, one of these cards, you can even uh, test drive uh, this solution in the, uh, in the Nimbix cloud. That concludes my uh, presentation. Fantastic. Round of applause for Maurice and Sean. That was a lot, so you probably have some questions. We've got a few minutes. Who here has a question for Xilinx? Anybody want to hit him up with a question? Mm, I'm not seeing any hands. You guys got any answers? <laughs> any answers? All right, uh, we have one. Uh, for the ML pipelines where you do like, you know, we can do face recognition or all sorts of those nice things. Uh, how does, how do you get programmatic access to those? As in like, do you provide like callback functions? Do you call callback functions? What do you, how do you utilize those? So how, how do I program what networks I want to run on, on what stream? Is, is that what you're asking? So the, the the results of so we, we um, uh, the results of the video analytics will be written in a in a database with uh, stream identifiers as well as the timestamps of the the frames that were analyzed and then you can uh, query uh, the database for a certain stream uh, on on like for example if you do object detection you will get a list of of rectangles plus an an uh, identifier of what object was found plus. Uh, for example, the, the percentage of the, um, yeah, the, the confidence level. Uh. So there, there is the ability for us to, there, there's kind of multiple ways you could, you could enable this. It could be an API, it could be, as, as Maury said, we, it can be enabled where you're, uh, you can put the results of whatever the machine learning um, result was into a database and then, or you could stream that out to the application and the application could then make use of that uh, information from, a, from an application standpoint. So there are kind of multiple ways that you could, you could enable that. Um, we have also done, or I should say we, Maurice has also done uh, some implementation where we've uh, enabled uh, uh, a machine learning kernel or IP uh, within FFmpeg, so you can even and kind of work at it in, in that direction as well. Well, thank you again, guys. This concludes Discovery Track for the moment. It is now time for coffee break. Please head into the uh, vendor area, get some coffee, relax, network. Discovery Track resumes at 4 o'clock.